What happens when individuals suffering from mental illnesses commit violent crimes? Often they're sent to forensic psychiatric hospitals, such as the Brockville Mental Health Center in Eastern Ontario. Documentary filmmaker John Kastner gained access to this facility and followed the treatment of patients for his film, Out of Mind, Out of Sight. The award-winning documentary will have its broadcast world debut immediately after tonight's episode of The Agenda. And with that, we welcome John Kastner, the filmmaker, and John Stewart, who appears in the film along with his family. His brother Michael was a patient at the Brockville Mental Health Center, and we are happy to have you two join us here at our table in Toronto tonight. Why did you make this film? Well, there comes a point when you're making a documentary, at least in my case, when a light bulb goes on and you say, I've got to make that film. In my case, it was realizing how much they can do for these forensic psychiatric patients because these guys commit these terrible acts occasionally, very rarely, and you see, people often think of them as monsters. Well, what I saw was what I call the Jekyll and Hyde transformation. Guys coming in what they call a floridly psychotic state and within a couple of months after two or three needles and some other help, a completely different person emerged and I thought the public has to see this. They have to know there's hope, there's help. That's my film. You got cameras behind closed doors in places where we traditionally don't get access to. And I, uh, full, full disclosure here, I saw your film before doing this today and it's, it's amazing what you see. It's scary too, what you see. How did you get that kind of access? Well, I have a history of making films that destigmatize somebody or, or, or other, but I had to be satisfied that, that these patients merited this kind of treatment, and I realized they're, just, they're not evil, they're just terribly, terribly ill. And I was able to use my old films where I've destigmatized this person and that person to convince the hospital staff that, you know what, I think I can maybe do this with some of the patients here, and boy, do they need it. They've been demonized as monsters, and it's just so unfair and so wrong. So, John, the cameras are on your family. That's Other right. John, John Stewart. The cameras are on your family for some of this documentary. And I wonder, your family went through a tragedy you don't want anybody else to suffer from. Why did you let him put the cameras on it? Um, well, it was a decision that was made collectively and with much deliberation. Um, I think, uh, actually, it's important to point out that, that the person who, who jumped on board first was Michael. Um, and that was a difficult choice for him to make. And once Michael was on board, it was, it was decided that uh, we would act in solidarity, solidarity with him and support him. How old is Michael now? Uh, Michael uh, is 35, I believe. And where's he at right now in his life? He lives in the community uh, of Brockville. He lives in an apartment in, in the city of Brockville in, in Ontario. Why was he in there to begin with? Uh, well, it was, it's a, it was the facility he, he's, in, he's in there because he, he was found not criminally responsible for, um, for, the, for his hand in, in the death of my mother in 2002. Uh, he hasn't spent his whole time in the, Bronc in the Brockville Mental Health Centre. He's, he's been to various other institutions, but uh, for, for most of the, of the last 11 years, that's where he's, he's stayed. But as I said, he's been released into the community uh, where he is responding well to treatment and he his health is, is stable, his mental health is, is stable at this moment. I appreciate the delicacy with which you described what happened, mm -hmm. um, but let's be clear, the fact is he killed your mother, but he was not criminally responsible, it was determined, for killing your mother. Mm -hmm. Why was that? Well, um, this is a bit of semantics here, but I think it's important. Um, I, I, I would never say that he killed my mother. I don't, I don't believe that that's the case. I believe that he, he's, he's a a person with a, a life-wrecking uh, brain disease or mental illness called schizophrenia. And um, I, I, I don't, I'm not speaking metaphorically here when I say that it was schizophrenia that, that was the cause of her death. So um, uh, does that answer your question? It does. So in other words, you're saying that, that the kid you grew up with couldn't have done this, the disease did this. That's what I'm saying. The condition did this. That's right. And that was the story you wanted to tell? Absolutely, absolutely. These people are not evil. They're just terribly ill. It's like blaming somebody for having cancer and, or blaming somebody for having tuberculosis, which if you go in the community at a certain point, you can spread tuberculosis and there can be harm from that, you know. Um, these people have been demonized as if it was their fault. Well, I mean, I think I asked you at one point, I said, how could you forgive 
uh, Michael, and you said, well, there's nothing to forgive. You don't, he was ill. You, you don't forgive illness. You don't forgive cancer. And I thought that's, that's it in a nutshell. That's what we wanted to show. John, I, I, I think I get how you ended up there, the whole issue of not needing to forgive. Did you start there as well? Um, well, Michael was quite sick. Uh, he was sick for, for quite some time before the event, uh, the tragic event in 2002. Um, and I think any household that has, that, that has sickness within it, um, uh, it can be tricky. And so there was, I say this publicly now, but for, for the longest time it was, a, a, it was a sentiment that was held privately, um, sort of a, a resentment and anger towards Michael. But these feelings were, were wrongheaded. And I'm, I'm willing to, to confess these, these sentiments now because I, I believe that there are other members of the public who might appreciate that an evolution of, of thought and, uh, uh, and, and to reach a position of compassion is, is possible. And in fact, in my experience, life is much better. It's a lot easier um, to, to ap approach the facts, um, to learn about the illness as a, as a medical issue, which is what it is, and uh, you know, peace, uh, inner peace can, can be achieved that way through, through simple understanding. That's you. How many siblings do you have? I have a twin sister and another older brother. And do they feel the same way as you do? Yes. Did they always? Um, yes, yeah. How about your dad? Well, my, my father, um, you know, he and my mother were, were largely left to deal with, with Michael's health on, on their own, and they were advocates on his behalf uh, from, the, from the very beginning. And, my, my father understood right away once the diagnosis was made that this was not Michael's fault and that he, he is a, a victim of, of, of this, brain, this mental illness. Um, so my, my brother has had my father's support from, from day one. Mm -hmm. And their relationship today is? It's very loving, it's very warm. My, my father continues to, to travel down to Brockville from his hometown in Renfrew and visits between my brother and my father um, have been frequent uh, f for the last you know, 15 years. John Kastner, there are going to be people who will listen to this and say, this is amazing, this is wonderful that you were able to get to a position where you could forgive your brother for, for the disease that killed your mother, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but not everybody will or can, and they're not going to get that. What would you say to them? I would say, first and foremost, that most of the victims of violence uh, in this case are family members. People who suffer from uh, paranoid schizophrenia who kill are not a great threat to public safety and, and it's very tragic as in the case of Carol Dedele, obviously what happened, but it is the exception. Mostly it is the families. Uh, it, they kill their flesh and blood and if they have decided to forgive the family member who did it what right do I or anybody else have to, to criticize them? They have a double horror to deal with. Uh, they've lost their mother, and, and, and the Stewarts have lost their son and, and brother. And who is it for me or anybody else to, to judge them, I think? Okay. Your documentary, which is fabulous, incidentally, um, obviously kickstarts a bigger discussion about what we do in these circumstances. And we're going to have some of that larger discussion right now. So we're going to invite a few others to join our table right now. We're going to broaden the discussion now, and we welcome to our broadcast in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Carol Dedelli. She is the mother of Tim McLean. He was the young man who was killed six years ago on a Greyhound bus by Vincent Lee. In the nation's capital via Skype, Heidi Illingworth, Executive Director of the Canadian Resource Centre for Victims of Crime. And also now with us in studio is Phil Klassen. He is a forensic psychiatrist and VP Medical Affairs at Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Services, uh, Sciences rather, and that's in Whitby, Ontario. And we welcome the three of you to our discussion as well. Hello. Uh, Carol, I, uh, I felt this way, uh, Michael, uh, or excuse me, John, in asking you to describe what happened with your situation. And uh, Carol, I, I kind of feel bad asking you to do this as well, but again, this is going to help us in our understanding. What happened to your son? Timothy was on his way home from working a, a fair out west. Um, he had been on the bus for about 20 hours already of a 22-hour trip. Um, he was sleeping and uh, was un suffered an unprovoked attack by a schizophrenic individual who decapita 
decapitated him and cannibalized him over a period of several hours. He was, uh, the offender was subsequently found not criminally responsible for the killing of my son. And what's your view of that verdict? Well, not criminally responsible, okay. I think it should be not psychologically responsible, still cr criminally accountable, because there was still a crime that was committed here, whether it was intentional or not. Um, I believe that the individual who committed this offense needs to be treated for his illness in a facility that can accommodate that and can ensure that he receives that treatment. The, the problem in Canada is that there is no law that requires this individual to take his treatment. So in essence what we do is we, le we leave the decision making of the uh, whether or not to treat the illness to that individual. So as in John's case with his brother, as he had mentioned and, and is usually the case, these types of um, individuals have often been seen by the system before. Their families have uh, repeatedly tried to get help for them, but because Canada is suffering a severe shortage of mental health care providers nationally, uh, it's very difficult to get that help until there's something like this and then they can get the treatment and uh, assistance that they require. I have no confidence that the system is any better prepared to deal with an individual like Vince Lee in the community uh, than it was six years ago that led to the death of my son, particularly if it's not in a major center. All right, let Those me get Phil Klassen in at this point to take us th through this, I guess, the NCR process, the not criminally responsible process. What happens to someone once they have been handed that sentence? So a verdict of not criminally responsible due to mental disorder uh, takes people from the criminal justice system to the forensic mental health system. Uh, typically, they'll have a first hearing before the review board in their province, uh, in, in our case, Ontario, uh, within about 45 to 90 days. And that review board, which is comprised of legal mental health uh, professionals and a member of the public, uh, will uh, make a decision with respect to uh, whether they remain within the system, which is very typically the case at an initial hearing, and uh, what kinds of constraints and limits and requirements uh, on their freedom and of the person uh, might be required. What's your view on where the appropriate place is to deal with crimes that are inevitably as heinous as these ones are, and yet there is this different aspect to it, not criminally responsible? If you mean where's the appropriate place to manage these individuals? Well, I mean, some people are going to say, we don't care about their mental health issues, put them in jail. Other people are going to say that's not the appropriate place. What do you say? First of all, there are uh, a substantial number of people in jail and in penitentiary suffering from mental illness, uh, partly because they may have been criminally responsible, because we have a system that's careful about who goes in which direction, and partly because suffering from a mental disorder is more likely to lead both indirectly and directly to the kinds of difficulties that might put you in touch with law enforcement. Uh, I think that uh, the public should be confident that we have a very thoughtful, deliberate process that leads to a verdict not criminally responsible due to mental disorder, and that those individuals that are diverted into the forensic system from the criminal justice system, uh, first of all, are, are given every effort at rehabilitation, as the courageous film of John Castor, uh, I think, indicates, and also uh, that the mental health pe uh, professionals in those organizations put public safety at the top of the list. Phil, let's follow up with this. I suspect there is a sense in some members of the public that if you can prove that you were not criminally responsible for the crime that you committed, somehow you're getting away with something. Can you speak to that? That, that certainly is uh, a sense that people in the general public have. I think that's uh, more likely to be less the case when you've had exposure to the forensic mental health system, as you've, you've heard about from the, from the film of John Kastner. Um, there's two parts to committing a crime, an evil act and an evil intent. If you lack the evil intent, uh, you go into, in a different direction. Uh, but the length of stay in the forensic mental health system is significant. The restrictions those individuals face are significant. The onus on the hospitals and the professionals managing those individuals is keenly felt. Uh, and, and I think that the notion that they're getting away from something is, is probably a, a product of a lack of of understanding uh, of the fact that, first of all, uh, these people are suffering, and secondly, uh, that there's a real accountability mechanism. 
Let me follow up on that evil act, evil intent. Uh, Carol, clearly what happened to your son was an evil act. Did you believe, though, that Vincent Lee committed it with evil intent? No, I think he was very a very sick individual who had been in contact with the mental health um, professionals on a number of occasions, as had so many others in this situation, and uh, did not receive the help that they needed. Um, oftentimes, by a lot of uh, different cases that I've read and people who have contacted me, the family members have tried and tried and tried to get these people help. But if that individual is in the slightest way resistant to treatment, there's nothing anybody can do because they are not legally, there's no law that legally requires them to treat their illness. John if, they come to, if they come to the yes, realization so that they need that treatment, great. Okay, John Kastner wants to follow up on That's that. That's not entirely so, uh, with all due respect, uh, Carol. Uh, in our, I've, I've been in the system for three and a half years, and uh, people are under the very rigid care of the hospital for years and years and years and years. In our first film, uh, NCR Not Criminally Responsible, the companion film to this one, Sean Clifton is out in the street for five years, but he's under a detention order. They can, they can practically call him back in if he looks at them crooked, so it's not entirely true. But even yeah. if, but, but even if they did, ultimately him or anybody else wouldn't be held responsible. There's no transparency, no accountability within the institutions. Years and years and years you say they're in treatment. Most of the cases I know of, they're out in three to five. Vince Lee is already on unsupervised passes full days out in the community and it's been well, only six years. Okay, well having, wa having been spent three and a half years wa as an outsider with no bi coming with no bias whatsoever, let me just tell you that anybody who thinks a get out of, these places are a get out of jail free card should watch the film tonight because you'll see four people who are struggling, who are in pain, who are having huge difficulty. If you think it's fun, or no, some I kind did, of I, don't I, 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 don't, I don't mean you. I'm sorry, Carol. I don't mean you. I'm, I'm talking about remarks that I've heard from, from other people. Uh, I think you'd find it eye-opening, actually, if you if you see the film no. and you see and it's it's a struggle. It really is for these yeah. people. Let, let's have, hear Carol, and I, no, I want to hear Phil have, on this. I have no doubt that it's a struggle, a daily struggle. What I struggle with is that um, my son died from a major mental illness, and he's not the one that had it. And there seems to be no recognition or, or uh, appreciation for the fact that my son had a life. And the, and the de devastation and disaster that has now become my family life, my situation. Um, Vince Lee doesn't have all of the supports and family and community and all that to, to help him. And if he chooses to live anywhere other than a major center, how is he going to get that treatment? If I had suffered a breakdown in this situation, I would have had to have gone to the same facility that is housing and treating a, a very um, mentally ill killer. I think that's wrong. I think there should be separate institutions, uh, a separate place where persons with mental illness who are trying to treat their illness can go and receive that treatment. It shouldn't be in a place that is housing criminals, uh, people who have performed criminal acts, whether they're responsible for them or not. Okay, let me get Phil Klassen in here. Can you <coughs> help clarify some of the disagreements we've heard? <coughs> yeah, I think one point that might be made is that there's a uh, what's often called a civil mental health system or the general mental health system. And I think it's with that system that Ms. Dedelli is taking issue in her comments. And then there's the forensic mental health system. And I think it's that system to which uh, Mr. Kastner is referring. Uh, in the latter system, the forensic system, uh, the ability of the of the supervising hospital and mental health team to make sure that people do the right things in terms of their rehabilitation, including medication, uh, is uh, very significant. Uh, in fact, people wind up in the forensic mental health system most commonly because there have been some gaps or problems uh, managing that individual and their illness in the general mental health system. Does that? I mean, that I understand the distinction, but does that help us deal with the? with the rage that victims no doubt feel at what has transpired here. John's a victim. Why, why do you ask John how he feels about uh, victims, about perpetrators getting freedom, including Michael? What do you think? Sorry. Um, I mean, uh, I, I don't, I, at this point, I don't see much disagreement between myself and Mrs. Didelli. For, uh, I think that's important to say, at, at least at this point. Um, I, I share her concerns. Our family share her concerns with respect to um, absolute discharge, for example, and um, and we have a, a shared problem. Um, and I, you know, I think, I, but I, I do think it's important to point out that that Michael is also a victim of violence. Um, now he he was the, uh, you know, it was his hand in, in 
in play here, but uh, he, he lives with that, that event as well, and he's a, he's a victim of violence. And so any, um, any outreach organization that has as their mandate to, um, to advocate for victims of violence, I, I, I wonder if, if that should not include uh, uh, patients um, with schizophrenia as well. Does he know what he did? Yes, he does. He does. Yeah. And does he have remorse for it? He lives with, with um, unimaginable anguish for, for, his, for his role in my mother's death. And the, you know, one of the most tragic, tragic uh, aspects of this is that in his most lucid, lucid and um, you know, well-thinking state, um, that agony must be all the more um, pronounced. Um, Okay, hold that thought for a second. Heidi, you've st uh, stood by very patiently listening to our discussion. Uh, chime in if you would and pick up on a point that you'd like to make. I mean, if I could just echo um, what Carol said earlier, our agency, um, we do believe that people with mental illness should be treated outside of the criminal justice system within hospitals, but we are, public safety is a concern for us and we are concerned about medication compliance and we are concerned about long-term supervision of that patient in the client or in the community, sorry, and particularly concerned about absolute discharges and leaving it up to that individual to have to, um, you know, take their own medication or leave it up to their family members to supervise them. We think that that should be, that responsibility should remain with, um, community mental health practitioners or even the hospital, especially in these serious, these extremely rare but very, very serious cases. Okay, let me get John Kastner to follow up on that. Do you think there ought to be obligations if, for example, you are not criminally responsible for having committed a heinous crime and you now find yourself after a certain amount of treatment out on a day pass or whatever, what obligations are there on that person to stay on their medication? If you get an absolute discharge and the intention of the, uh, the, the law and, and the philosophy of these hospitals is that ultimately as many patients as possible are going to get an absolute discharge, you can walk away free and clear. In theory, it's absolutely true. You don't hear of NCR patients getting out, even those who go off their beds, doing a lot of serious violence. There certainly are issues. So recidivism uh, is not a big issue? Recidivism yet? is not the issue that it's being, I think it's wildly overblown. The threat is wild, it, yes, it's there, it's there on paper, it can happen. Mm -hmm. But as one of the doctors at Brockville said to me, this is a town of 22,000 people. They've been shoveling patients out in the community for decades. If they were going out and violently reoffending all the time, they would run us out of town. Hmm. I've only heard of three cases in the 20 years that I have, I have been there. So without make, my making a judgment on this, just anecdotally, I'll offer that. You want to do that, John? Well, it's also, um, and maybe uh, Dr. Klassen can, can correct me, but as I understand it, um, uh, people suffering from mental illness actually stand uh, greater risk from harm and hostility from the public. And, and so, you know, this, this is an important conversation to have, but it, it would be really nice one day if we could start to talk about, um, about greater help um, and, and greater uh, attention paid by our society for people who are living with this illness. Because as it stands right now, um, for, for people with mental illness who are... Um, who are, who are not helped and are abandoned by their families, um, we as a, a society are essentially asking them to take care of themselves. And that's an intolerable um, uh, state as far as I'm concerned. And, and, it's, and it's still, I think, too much of a burden to ask families to be um, the, the principal care providers for people with mental illness because we're, we're, we're simply not equipped to do, to do it. So I'll just say that in our case, with our family, um, it, it is, it's quite unusual that, that Michael had sort of the, the, um, the, the support that he had and all of the attention, and my, and my parents were equipped to do that, but it was, it was, it was a, it's difficult. Well, let me follow up with Phil on this particular angle. If somebody who's committed this crime, not criminally responsible, finds himself out on a day pass or, uh, for, you know, free and clear, as it were, what obligations are there on them to stay on their meds? Well, there's a huge continuum of potential obligations, and I want to 
first of all, just echo that we know that recidivism rates for these individuals found not criminally responsible are low and are a fraction of the recidivism rates seen in the general offender population. That is this, what the evidence shows. It's what the evidence shows in the report sent to the, to the Department of Justice in November of 2012, and it's a great report, and it's very clear that this system, uh, the forensic mental health system, is working well. Uh, the obligations on the uh, on the accused person vary uh, from uh, when they're in hospital, uh, they have more restrictions and more obligations, and yes, when they're absolutely discharged, they are free of any obligations to the community, but that process leading to an absolute discharge is an extremely cautious process. Okay, in which case I want to go to Carol. D Carol, does that, does the knowledge that odds are Vincent Lee, who killed your son, is not going to reoffend? does that give you pause uh, in your understanding of what the future looks like? Pause in my understanding. <clears throat> I think that an individual such as Vince Lee with his illness, as severe as it is, and it is off the charts, it's an extreme, it was an extreme case. I think that when a, a person is that ill, that cannot appreciate his, the consequences of his actions, um, and has proven himself to be non-compliant, I think that he needs to remain in a facility that will uh, continue to make sure that he receives the treatment he requires. I don't, you know, talking about his, his obligation, what is his obligation? Well, what is his legal requirement is what I want to know because if he did reoffend, what would then be the case? We just repeat this whole process. Nobody again would be responsible or accountable, hmm. neither him nor the, the people in the facility that was housing him. Phil Classen, can you speak wrong. to that? Uh, well, I, I, he, the, the individual himself may or may not be not criminally responsible. Uh, it could happen, in theory, that a person with an illness like that, when treated, commits another offense and is criminally responsible, and that might well be the outcome. I, I can assure you that those of us working in the mental health system take very seriously uh, the management of public safety, and we would certainly consider ourselves to be part of the accountability process. Uh, happily, uh, you know, recidivism rates are low. Uh, it's a good process. And, and I think that the public should be confident that there are a lot of safeguards in place. Well, let's find out uh, if, if one of them is in place when Vince Lee is out. Do you know, Carol, if when he is out, uh, is he accompanied by people? No, he has, he has unescorted full day passes in the community. What do you think about that? What do I think about it? I don't, I don't like it. I don't think that that should have even ever been an option. Um, never. I, my whole stance has always been, um, a life for a life. If you take a life, you lose your freedom for the rest of your life. Treat him, yes. Treat him, medicate him to a place where he can live with his own mind and with what he has uh, done to devastate another family. I I'm sorry that he has this illness. I think that we should treat him humanely and treat him in a facility that is equipped to take care of him. But leaving the decision to medicate to him is, is uh, I don't think, is a very smart decision at all. John Kastner, your view on that? Well, uh, uh, on the other hand, in my, uh, in my experience, my last film, Sean Clifton, who tried his best to murder a girl in a mall in Cornwall, has been out in the community for five years, and uh, there's been absolutely not a hint or a whisper of violence, and this is the rule in my experience. I know of three cases in the 20-year history of the Brockville Hospital of the uh, uh, hundreds of patients that they've had in which an NCR patient has reoffended in a serious manner, and statistically, that's pretty small. The question is, should you change the law, change the system for such a, a, a small number of people, or should the system and the law serve really the interests of the larger number of people in the community? Carol, you I want think, to respond to that? I think that if it is such a truly small number of individuals that we are talking about, that it shouldn't be a problem to create a facility that is designed and specially equipped and, and um, um, employs the, the proper individuals and professionals to take care of and monitor, this, monitor these, uh, this very small number of individuals. Because if they do reoffend, and it has happened, uh, there was one fellow on the East Coast who committed a murder on a one-hour pass from a facility that was housing him. It does happen. What, you know, even if it's 7% or whatever the percentage is, what kind of comfort is, is the family of the, of the next victim supposed to take from that? They knew that this person was mentally ill, extremely or severely. I think it's fair to say that there's an extreme shortage of mental health care workers across the country. I don't believe that the system is any better prepared to... Um, manage and long-term treat these people and if they're not required legally to seek that treatment and take that medication 
then the rest of us are just, I mean, what do you say to that? So, what do you okay. do to John, that? John Stewart wants in. So it's, I'm, I'm a, bit, a bit confused with Mrs. Uh, Dedelli's um, proposal here. It sounds as if she, in, in, one, in one moment, acknowledges the illness as a fact, and then in the second moment, uh, she characterizes uh, you know, this is a crime and uses phrases like a life for a life. Um, I, I don't know how you can hold to what seems to me uh, conflicting um, incompatible opinions. And my question, I suppose, would be uh, to, to people who, who share this opinion is, what would you call this kind of institution? Um, because it sounds to me as if that would be uh, a, a prison to, for, to hold um, the mentally ill. And uh, that's the sort of thing that we we had in place 40 or 50 years okay. ago. I, I, but I think her position is that the risk of reoffending uh, and the lack of oversight to ensure mm -hmm. that somebody who may not be criminally responsible for but who has committed this crime, the lack of oversight all adds up to uh, a combination of uh, a lack of security that the person therefore needs to be in this facility forever. Sure, but these the scenarios that the scenarios that Mrs. Del, um, Dedelli is is imagining uh, aren't, aren't borne out in reality. So the, stati the statistics and the numbers show um, that recidivism is not, um, uh, is, is not, is not in, 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 at a scope where it, it needs uh, these, these measures that you're proposing. Okay, let me get one comment from Carol and then I want to get Heidi back in here. Go ahead, Carol. I, I am talking specifically of incurable, extremely ill killers who have committed these horrific acts. I'm not talking about everybody with mental illness that, that has done um, some things that they're not criminally responsible for. I'm talking about the very rare uh, and extreme cases. I if he was curable, that would be one thing. He's not curable. But we, don't um, a, we don't have a cure okay. for schizophrenia. I mean, no, we don't. But, it, I but know it's that. treatable. The, the I understand that too, but in order to make sure that he gets that treatment, I think it needs to be in a facility. I don't, I'm not saying we treat them in, inhumanely at all. I, I'm, I'm trying to ensure the safety of everyone in this case. And, and you know, Vince Lee came here in 2001 from China, and he, he received treatment for schizophrenia and his Canadian citizen, citizenship in the same year. So it's not an overnight illness. He had been in contact uh, with professionals on several occasions and in, in a couple of different provinces, and they failed him. Okay, okay with, Phil Klass, and let's get me. Phil, and then I want to get Heidi in. Uh, just quickly, I just wanted to point out that when people do have truly treatment refractory illnesses, that they stay in facilities. Uh, I want to be clear about that. Refractory Unfortunately, illnesses? So when people have an illness that it does not respond to treatment and uh, the risk remains, uh, they do remain uh, in custodial facilities. Uh, I think, though, that I, I would echo uh, John's point that I think there's a decision that we uh, collect, uh, 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 that victims, that professionals, that the community need to make about do we want to go more in the direction of restorative justice? Uh, and I think that John's family experience really exemplifies that well, or more in the direction of retributive justice. And You're empirically, arguing for the former. Um, uh, well, empirically, restorative justice, certainly for marginalized populations, the mentally ill, aboriginal persons, female offenders, youths, that restorative justice is as effective in, prevent in preventing recidivism as retributive justice. Okay, let me get Heidi in to comment on the new changes that are before the Parliament of Canada as we speak. The new Not Criminally Responsible Reform Act, which is Bill C-14, which involves putting public safety first, creating a high-risk designation, and enhancing victims' involvement. Heidi, do you think this bill, if enacted, would enhance public safety? Well, I think that the goal of the legislation was to enhance public safety. Um, I'm not, I think we're going to have to wait to see how that plays out, especially uh, around the high-risk designation. Um, you know, I just, uh, I want to echo what we hear at my office from family members who are impacted and it is as as Carol has said that there is often a history um, people ha are on, compliant with medication for a while they deteriorate maybe they're not able to recognize their symptoms sometimes people do reach out for help as in um, the case of Sean Clifton in the movie uh, John's first movie um, and he wasn't given the help that he needed at the time, and there, so victims and their families really worry about that that cycle is going to repeat itself. 
Um, and, you know, the issue of someone having to remain on medication for the rest of their life um, as part of their treatment is really critical, and how can we ensure that that happens? John Kastner, what do you think of this new bill before Parliament? Well, I just want to say that, uh, you know, is locking these people up the only answer? Uh, in, in our first film, the Sean Clifton film, NCR Not Criminally Responsible, the father of the victim, a year before the legislation came out, had another approach. He talked about mandatory medications. Well, you don't necessarily have to lock people up in a prison to have mandatory medication. John Stewart, do, does your brother have any uh, lingering oversight that ensures that, I don't know, if he's on medication, he stays on his meds, if he needs to be supervised, he is supervised? Help us understand that. Uh, well, he, he receives regular, uh, regular care from, from, the social, um, from, from social workers. Um, no, he's not by law obliged to take his medication, um, but he is responding to treatment, um, and people with schizophrenia do respond uh, well to, to, to treatment, um, but as I said, the, 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 the risks of Michael reoffending and committing a, um, an, a, an act of violence are, it's, it's highly unlikely. As long as he stays on his meds? Um, I think that even we you know he if he if he's off his meds he deteriorates very quickly, but his his deterioration doesn't necessarily um, result, in violence. result in violence. No, John. Can I ask Dr. Klassen? I mean, certainly I, I have heard it said that when schizophrenic patients uh, do uh, do kill, for example, there's often a secondary factor. It's not just a question of going off your meds and you become psychotic. Could you? Talk about that a little bit. Sure, there, there's a number of risk factors that are known to be associated with violent behavior. I think one of the one of the points I would raise in the comments of both Johns uh, from mm -hmm. the last film and the, and what I understand to be the the subject of the current film is that it took years for people to get to the point where they committed serious violence in both cases. Many opportunities to intervene. Major mental illness is key, uh, but. You know, when you're impoverished and marginalized, you yourself become traumatized, you develop addictions, you're homeless, you lose your supports, people don't like you because you smell or you don't talk the right way. There's a whole host of social factors that compound the illness factors. And if you give uh, that kind of a scenario enough time, indeed you may wind up with, uh, with a behavioral problem or even serious violence as we've seen. Do you think though legally we ought to oblige people who have encounter this situation to stay on their meds well for as long as it's required so you know the court as I understand it is not going to permit that to happen that uh, that is just not something that uh, can be legislated uh, but uh, the proxy is certainly in the forensic system uh, if you're not on your medication you're not getting access to the community and Carol, I presume your position is, yes, there ought to be some way to oblige these people to stay on their meds forever? Yes. That would be my position, yes. Um, as, as has been said, it, if they decide not to take their medication, the deterioration of their mental status can, can be rather rapid. Um, and quite frankly, the truth is that they just don't know. So far, recidivism rates are low, and chances are maybe they won't reoffend. But the chance is still there that they could, that they would. Um, I, I just, I don't know how they can properly make sure and ensure treatment for these individuals. But I do think it ought to be um, a condition of their release that okay. they are legally obligated Which one of you two to wants take in medication. Here? John Kastner. In the last film, NCR Not Criminally Responsible, we're talking very theoretically here. I want to give you a very concrete example. The victim, Julie Bouvier, was nearly stabbed to death by Sean Clifton. Having seen the film, having gotten to know him, she has not only forgiven him, she goes around making speeches in support of him. And this is a woman who lived with the terror that he was going to get out, come after her because he held a grudge that she was in a mental hospital. This was not a theoretical fear. And yet, this is a victim who took quite a different position on, on, on this, this issue. So it's a complicated issue. John Stewart, I've got 30 seconds left. Let me give it to you and ask you, what does your brother's future look like now? I, it doesn't look great. Um, you know, there is no cure for this illness. Um, I think that we should be working harder to find one. Illnesses can be cured. I think that the, I think that the disease should be, should be better funded. Um, Michael, under treatment, uh, has a sort of a balanced, steady 
life. Um, he's enjoyable company, um, but he is badly disabled um, by this mental illness. And I, I wish him <coughs> a full life, but I fear that in his lifetime that might not be possible um, unless we can work harder to, to cure the illness. This okay. is what I hope. I would agree Th with you, and I, and I really agree that the system needs vast improvement and, and more funding, because quite frankly, without funding, nothing changes. I appreciate all of you coming on tonight and sharing your views on this issue, and now we want to see the movie. Uh, Carol Dedelli, we thank you for being there on the line from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Heidi Illingworth, via Skype from the nation's capital. Phil Klassen, John Stewart, John Kastner, here in our studio in Toronto. Thanks so much, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.